Hey there, you're listening to the Voice of San Diego's podcast, where we consider cannabis culture and politics in San Diego and beyond. I'm Jesse Marks, associate editor here, and I'm joined by our engagement editor, Kinsey Moreland, who covers arts and culture. Sup? Hey. <laughs> so we've got a good show for you this week. In the second half, we're going to talk to some folks who are working to create a cannabis certificate program at a local community college. They say there's big money-making opportunity. Well, some big, some little money-making opportunities opening up, and they want to train San Diegans for entry-level jobs in the budding cannabis industry. See what I did there? Without veto, we need more puns. So I know. Thank you. Pot puns. Gotta, I have to Google them before I come in next time and slip them in <laughs> as often as possible. First, Jesse, I wanted to start, before we get to our guest, by talking to you about your latest cannabis scoop. You reported that California pot regulators have stepped up their enforcement efforts. And recently, they sent out more than 1,200 cease and desist letters to unlicensed operators. How many of those went to unlicensed outfits here in the San Diego region? Yeah, so, so far we know that letters have gone out to about 375 San Diego-based operators. Whoa! But the numbers are rising by the day. Wow. Uh, And in fact, we recently got a list of those operators through the California Bureau of Cannabis Control. Really? They gave us the data, and uh, the majority of those who received cease and desist letters um, were appear to be delivery services, uh, many of whom operate in San Diego, but as well as North County, and some of them actually operate out of both. And I think that's significant because it 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 gives some ammunition to the medical marijuana activists who've been saying for a very long time that sick and elderly patients need better access. So what better way to get your access than through delivery? Mm-hmm. Uh, what we don't know, though, is how much product these operators are moving. Somebody on that list could have posted an advertisement online, say, and never actually delivered. Or maybe this was their full-time job. We just don't know for sure. Hmm. Uh, But in San Diego, there are, uh, let's see, 46 dispensaries on the list. Actually, I should say most are in San Diego, but some of them are also in North County. Some of them are in unincorporated parts of the community close to San Diego. Uh, And there are actually three of them in your hometown of Lemon (laughs) Grove. Which probably won't <laughs> surprise surprised. you, Not right? surprised. <laughs> and interesting to note, several of San Diego's legal dispensaries actually wound up on that list. And I'm, what? Yeah, so they received cease and desist letters, and I, I presume that's by mistake. I, huh. I reached out to state regulators for clarification, and I have not gotten an explanation yet. Okay, interesting stuff. So in San Diego, as we know, there are t- just 12 licensed dispensaries selling medical and recreational products. And about another 12 licensed facilities doing things like testing and distribution. So 375 and rising warning letters went out. And there's just the 24 legal operators here. So even if there are some of those mistakes, um, what's up with that huge gap? What are these numbers telling us? Well, I think the numbers tell us that the black market in San Diego and the region is doing just fine. Um, (laughs) Honestly, I just, I mean, just think about it. San Diego's population is 1.4 million. The region itself is home to more than 3 million people. Until the cities are actually up and running with licensed dispensaries and delivery services, I think this is going to be an ongoing problem because it's it's really just a simple matter of supply and demand. And I think by banning cannabis businesses within your hometown or your neighborhood, you're not going to extinguish the appetite for cannabis. And that's been sort of the operating theory, and I think it's being challenged for the right reasons right now. Right. So uh, I covered the illegal dispenser issue a few months ago by zeroing, zeroing in on my neighbors there in Spring Valley and Casa de Oro. Those are two unincorporated county communities. They're under the purview of the county government, which has effectively banned marijuana dispensaries and cannabis business for the next five years. And I wanted to just circle back and give our listeners an idea of why this is an issue. Because, you know, my neighbors included, um, people just wonder, like, you know, you drive by, (laughs) you're a sheriff, you drive by a dispensary, it's very clearly, it's got green lights, blatant advertising, everyone knows it's there. Why can't they just go in and shut it down. Um, And I talked to Sheriff Lieutenant Tom Seaver. He covers the station that, or he works in the station that patrols Spring Valley and Caso de Oro. And he told me, I mean, in short, the process just takes a long time and it uses a lot of resources. It involves doing an investigation, getting the county office of code enforcement involved. And then their first line of defense is sending out a cease and desist letter. 
And those letters, you know, just aren't. <laughs> Sometimes they're text messages, too. <laughs> <laughs> they're just not very threatening. And so they often get ignored. So here is uh, Tom explaining why. They don't necessarily, they know that we have now noticed them and that we've served them, but that usually doesn't shut them down. Uh, the problem is uh, that we can, we as in code enforcement from the county side can only find them so much and they're making so much more money than the fines, than uh, what you end up having is, um, it's just the cost of doing business is to pay the fines. And a lot of the places like this one will open up, we'll go and uh, do a search warrant on it eventually, and it'll shut down. It may shut down, it may move. Uh, they may just reopen the next day. Uh, it, it depends on the dispensary and, and how much money they're making. But it, in the end, they they make more money. Uh, they make it they make a sizable amount of money before we can actually um, sh shut them down or do a search warrant on them. So Jesse, before I get your thoughts on that, uh, for that same story, I also interviewed Jacob Saunders, and he was a very young, uh, friendly employee at an unlicensed marijuana dispensary in Caso de Oro. And Jacob told me that he'd love to be a licensed dispensary owner get in on that legal market, but that he looked at the price of permits and said it just didn't pencil out for him. Getting his licenses, and, you know, it's not a bad route to go. I don't believe it's a bad route to go, but they make it way too difficult. It's way too expensive. You can't let an average American get into the business anymore, and I think they're doing it on purpose. They don't, you know, they don't want you to be able to walk in with a hundred grand and start a business. They want you to walk in with a million dollars and then give the city a hundred grand just to have your name. I think, I think they've put us to, to a point where you either have to be a big business type person or you have to, or they, you have to act like a criminal. You have to hide. Be rich or yeah, exactly. You have to be rich or you don't, you don't really, you know, get the option and it doesn't leave a lot of room for us. Um, I actually think that it's going to be a huge negative. All of it's going to go to the streets. It's all going to go to the streets. No one's going to pay, you know, the money for the product when they know they can go to the streets and get it there. So that dispensary where Jacob works, by the way, I went back later and it was closed down during a raid by Tom and his sheriffs. Um, I'd be willing to bet, though, that it's either open right back up or soon after or move to a new location. So that's really I mean, honestly, that really is how bad the issue is in Spring Valley and Casa de Oro. It's uh, sheriffs call it whack-a-mole. They just feel like they can't really do much of anything. So, Jesse, do you think these latest enforcement efforts will actually make a dent or change that in any way? No, I don't. And and frankly, neither does Tom. I actually interviewed him again for this story Um after you uh, recorded that interview that we just played a second ago. And and he said it may scare a couple of people straight, but those people are presumably the honest ones. And if you never intended to get a license, why would you stop now? Uh, I mean, all you need to do is buy a new phone. You can open a new email address. You can post a new advertisement on a different um, uh, website with a different name, and you'll be just fine. And I think that's how regulators have been finding these these operators, just based on the information they post online. But if that information isn't correct, then what do you do? Right. So before we move on to our interview, I just wanted to play one last clip. And that is from the Voice of San Diego podcast last week. Uh, Scott Lewis and Andy Keats did a really interesting in-depth interview with District Attorney Summer Stefan. And in it, she addressed the black market issue. And she pretty straightforwardly said, prosecuting the people behind these illegal operations just isn't one of the office's priorities. Am I going to take resources away from dealing with a murder or domestic violence or a child abuse to deal with a dispensary? No, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to follow the law. And, if, and the law says it should be a legal dispensary. Mm -hmm. And if within looking at all of my resources, I can... I can execute the law in all areas. I will do that, but I always want to keep my eye on the ball as to what are my priorities. All right. Well, Jesse, thanks for updating us on the state of the black marijuana market in the region. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Stay tuned, listeners, because after a quick break, we'll talk to Christine Fallon and Nathan Liu about a new class 
at the San Diego Community College District Cesar Chavez campus that works to train people for jobs in the cannabis industry. Hi again. We're here in the beautiful Voice of San Diego podcast studio with Christine Fallon. She's the director of continuing education at the San Diego Community College District's Cesar Chavez campus. Woo! That's Ooh, a mouthful. That is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. Thanks for being here. No, thank you. Thank you. Christine organized an intro to cannabis course last year and another one this year that just wrapped up this week, right? Yeah, uh, just finishing up on Wednesday at nine o'clock. All right. Yeah, very and nice. And also in the studio, we have Nathan Liu. Nathan was a lecturer in the cannabis course, and he is also the food justice co-chair for Slow Food Urban San Diego. And he is the co-founder of Mongol Tribe, a nonprofit that provides health, wellness, and ecology consultations and educational programs. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you two. Before we ask you questions about this cannabis class, we wanted to give our listeners kind of a better sense of some of the local jobs out there in the marijuana industry. Uh, Jesse, I found one from budtrader.com. It's described as the world's largest online legal cannabis classified ad marketplace. It's based in Encinitas, which I did not know. Nice. Uh, that company got a lot of attention when they posted a job looking for a 420 product tester, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> uh, most of the headlines about the job were some variation of get paid to smoke pot. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'm sure they got hundreds, if not thousands, of applicants. Bud Trader, by the way, is also looking for a marketing director. A little bit more normal of a gig there. Um, but reading the description for that job was pretty funny. In the post, it says, doing a good job here, and I'm quoting, is kind of like wetting your pants in a dark suit. You get a warm feeling, but no one notices. (laughs) (laughs) So you can tell there's a little different culture in that office, huh? Yeah, I see that. (laughs) And not quite as exciting, but there, we also noticed an opening for purchasing director at Tory Holistics Dispensary, which Mm -hmm. is interesting, a little bit more mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um, that actually pays between $50,000 and $60,000. Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. And we all also saw, though, that Urban Leaf had an opening for a medical and recreational dispensary uh, bud tender. Um, but that pays $15 an hour, which, I mean, all things considered is good, but it's not quite as, as high as you might imagine. Um, the description for that basically calls for people with extensive knowledge about cannabis, and it even lists reading industry publications to keep up to date on trends as one of the job requirements. Sadly, it does not include this podcast, but <laughs> good time, hopefully. Okay, so let's talk about the next generation of bud tenders. Yes. Christine, mm-hmm. tell us about the Intro to Cannabis course you've put sure, together sure. and how it prepares students for the cannabis and hemp industry. What topics are you covering? Well, uh, the first night cover- covers horticulture, and that's where Nathan really plays the leading role in all of it. Um, you know, he has so much experience, not only with cannabis, but all different kinds of plants. So any kind of questions that might be falling out of the sky where I can't answer because it really goes into just the varietals. He's your expert. You know, this guy is just wonderful, especially for anybody who's interested in cultivation, um, indoor cultivation, outdoor cultivation, everything and anything. Um, he's your guy. So I am really, really happy and completely blessed to have him on board. Uh, the second night, um, which is actually focusing on pharmacology, that's where I think your bud tenders are going to be more interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, just figuring out how the endocannabinoid system actually works within the body. Um, And then, of course, just on various varietals that are out there and just kind of some of the the crazy research that's out there um, that some people need to know when they are buying various products. Mm -hmm. Um, Finally, the last night, this is one thing that people are probably the most interested in is probably the the industry aspect of it, Uh, talking about all of the permits and um, trying to get on board with that. Um, You know, we're pretty positive. We bring in um, some great speakers. Uh, Dr. Michelle Sexton was on board with pharmacology. She's currently working at UCSD. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. we're going to try to get her for one of these. Yeah, episodes. absolutely. Yeah. If you need any help, let's see what we could do. But um, she is a valuable resource. Uh, they're currently doing some tests at UCSD about driving. Um, one of my uh, students just in the, the cannabis class um, at uh, San Diego uh, City College, or um, San Diego Community College, um, he actually is one of the volunteers. Um, he's actually going to be 
smoking pot and driving and getting paid for it. You know, I really don't know. I think there is some kind of stipend if you do get selected that you do get some money. Mm-hmm. Um, he does not want to be in the placebo group, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he did get selected. And so um, it's out there. It's the cannabis research um, at UCSD. So if anybody's interested, they could get involved in that. And then, um, sorry, finally, the last night is um, Dion McGrath, as well as Terry Best from um, ASA, which is the San Diego chapter here, the American for Safe Access. Um, Dion is actually the founder of, of ASA. So he's the one who started the San Diego chapter here. Um, he was one of the first ones to start the first dispensary um, here in Ocean Beach. Um, and that was that was shut down, what do you call it? La Casa Verdad. Verde Verdad, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever I, heard of it. Yeah, I've Have seen, you? I, and I've seen him around meetings, and I've seen him give his pitch before on okay. the Hemp House. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't want to get sidetracked, but that is pretty amazing. I <laughs> think is. listeners should just Google that because it's oh, wild. It is, and it will be at the um, Earth Fair. Um, he is going to be doing the Earth Day. Um, we do have nice. a cannabis village out there too, so you can have a, a chance to look at the trailer itself. It's pretty awesome. Plastic is big with hemp as well. Um, and that goes into the last night where we kind of deviate from the flower onto more industry and really just a lot of the benefits that hemp provides for the industry. So so, so tell us about your lobbying efforts with the community college district. because I, And I think mm-hmm. the last time we spoke, you mentioned that you would, you would like to create a certificate program mm-hmm. for this. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us about your efforts and why you think that's important. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, certificate programs lead into employment. And that's really where I'd like to see us bridge uh, the gap from the industry to the education. Um, one thing that, of course, you know, what's happening for most universities is this is a new field. You know, this is something that people are really taking it slow. Um, Colorado, of course, is another place where you could see an undergraduate program um, in cannabis studies. Uh, some other states have gotten on board with some of those types of programs, but they're really embedded in other programs that have already that are already in existence right now. Um, so it's just kind of like if you are in um, pharmacy you know, nursing or something like that. There might be an extra course where you can study cannabis, but it's not really the focus. Are, are you getting any pushback from the community college district? Is there some hesitation to be too closely aligned maybe with the cannabis industry? Um, I'm not exactly feeling too much of that. What I, I see is that they are taking it slow because they're not quite sure on what they want to grow it into. Um, currently, we do have 12 hours um, from the program. And of course, that's just not limited to San Diego Community College. Um, I've actually uh, sent out an email to uh, Cuyamaca. Uh, Gross Mount Cuyamaca and also Southwestern. Um, So if they do want to take on this program, um, currently we have pretty solid 12 hour contact hours, um, but that could be easily grown into a semester if that's what they want. So Nathan, let's get you in here. Uh, What are some of the most important things people thinking about a job in the marijuana or hemp industry should know? Um, I know you cover the history of cultivation, um, what are other, should they be well-versed on policy? What are the most important things? Yeah. So, uh, my entry into the cannabis field, uh, was centered around my health. So I'm, I'm a medical cannabis patient and I've been so since 2004. So it's something for me that I appreciate how the industry has grown in its, uh, ability to now test the product. So, so that part of it, it, you know, when it comes to health and wellness and understanding why someone would pick one varietal or one phenotype over another phenotype, right? That the medicinal benefit is really for me as a, as a consumer is the most important. So I, I need to know that what I'm in, what I'm ingesting is going to be not only healthy for me, but it's going to give me the effects that I need for my, my healing. So that's like, to me, number one is, Mm -hmm. um, you have to understand that the medicinal value. And of course, like, you know, we have the recreational market opening up, but I still find that, uh, cannabis to me is, is still in, in that same field of as a medicine. So, uh, I think that, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of other, you know, over the counter medications that people utilize just let's say, for example, coffee, you know, coffee is, uh, is also hallucinogenic and people consume it every day. So we still like to know what kind of coffee we're getting and where it comes from. So I feel with cannabis, it's the same thing is uh, people should know where their sourcing is. Is it coming from a local farm or is it coming from somewhere that, you know, doesn't really put the mindfulness into their practice? So in, in one of your course descriptions, you, you mentioned the, the, the misuses of potentially of cannabis, the uses and misuses, I think. Can, yeah. can you give us a sense of what some of the misuses would be of, of cannabis? 
Well, uh, you know, of course, operating heavy machinery is a no-no after cannabis <laughs> use, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the misuse is, uh, it, it's like anything else. It can be abused. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something that I feel like, again, since, uh, since my initial uh, use of it in, in 2004 to where we are currently, there's, um, there's a lot more understanding about the different uh, aspects of the chemicals going into it and what each one is going to do. So I feel like sometimes uh, you may get a, a particular type that will, you know, they say give you couch lock, right? It's, it's not going to make you the most productive person. So to <laughs> me, that's, that's not something you want to intake before you go to work, right? Versus something like, um, you know, like this Harlequin, something that's a high CBD, low THC ratio. This is something that gives us the medicinal benefits and allows us to, you know, go about our day to day. So to me, that's the kind of the misuse comes into lack of education of which type to choose and um, how much to consume. So that's, again, that's something that we're, we're being able to see more education about as we have moved forward in the industry. Mm -hmm. so, so it seems like there are a lot of tips that you guys give, not just for people who would want to be in the industry, but consumers as well, right? I mean, they're, they're also your target audience. And do you yeah. get people for this class who don't necessarily want to work in the cannabis industry, oh, yeah. but want to say just like, I want to know which strains are right for me? And, and how detailed do you get with figuring out which strains are right for people? Yeah, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, a, it's a very short period of time. So, you know, that's what we're working towards is being able to provide more content. And that's why we're looking towards the certificate program, because I feel like uh, after the class, we leave, uh, you know, students with a very broad scope of understanding about how the field could work. But of course, with more knowledge comes a more awareness that you need to know more. There's more details out there. So uh, I feel like we give as much detail as possible in the short period of time without overwhelming folks. Mm -hmm. You know, we want people to maintain their interest. Um, and so, of course, we have folks that are either actively in the industry or looking to join it. Um, folks that want to start a farm, not necessarily even in California, but let's say on an island, you know, so uh, it, it's a uh, good luck, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know so like that's part that of the island. challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, is um, is there's different scopes and scales at which people are interested. But the general person coming in, I think, can get a, an idea about if they want to produce for themselves, they can get an idea of what mm -hmm. it's going to take and be able to now have a direction to go with those questions. Right on. Yeah. So. Other than the jobs we mentioned at the top of our interview, you know, bud tender being the most mm -hmm. recognizable, which I do appreciate a good, knowledgeable bud tender. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I just went to my first recreational dispensary and we talked about that last week. And it was so I mean, I had so many dumb questions, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and the complaint I, I hear far and wide is that the bud tenders just don't have enough time really to work with people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these yeah. more popular dispensaries have a lot of tourists coming in and out really quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of just been turning people around as fast sure. as possible. Right, right. right. So there's that job. And, and obviously the benefits of being educated for that position are obvious. But mm -hmm. what are some other jobs that we didn't touch on? Well, I've, you know, I've talked to some of the bud tenders and they're slowly going into cultivation. They're going into testing. You know, they're actually, I guess you could say, graduating Working from the up. position. <laughs> hey. yeah. um, so therefore, um, you know, whatever your major interest is, you know, keep that in the back of your mind because certification is just right around the corner. Um, it's the industry that needs to demand it. It's us. It's the customers. We need to go into the, the, the dispensaries and say, hey, are you getting your buds tested? You know, I'm um, just kind of curious, you know, what kind of uh, pesticides, you know, is anything kind of registering? Do you, can you tell me that? Of course, they could tell me what's the terpenes. They could tell me the THC and the <laughs> CBD value in it. But yeah. I'm talking really about are they getting tested for, you know, adulterants? Um, and that's another field entirely is the whole, mar the whole I hate to call it marijuana, but cannabis mm -hmm. uh, testing is um, that's another thing that we need to start demanding and actually seeing. Um, and that itself will turn into another, you could call it a certificate program would be specifically focusing on the testing aspect well, of it. Yeah. It seems like this is happening really fast, too, because on July 1st, the, like the city of San Diego, I know, has to have greater, um, the, like that's the point at which greater testing and labeling restrictions right. mm -hmm. start. I mean, this is happening really quickly. Oh, it you, is. Yeah. Like from, from both of your perspectives, do you, do you feel like the industry here is ready for these changes that are coming up in the next few months? You know, there's there's two like even on Wednesday night, you know, we had two advocates and both had two different views. You know, it, one felt that Proposition 64 still has a lot of problems to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not 100 percent clear for the patients that are involved in this. You know, we got to look at the difference between recreational and medical. There's there's a difference there. Yeah. Um, then, of course, you know, on the other side, we have an advocate who's just happy that you're able to go into a store and buy cannabis. You know, that's a dream of his. So, you know, um, you know, some people are looking at it as a 
huge, bright future where we could just jump right in and then we'll start making all of our regulations. Yeah. Other people are more cautious. They're saying, hey, we need to get the regulations first before we start you know, putting this stuff out. So, I mean, all in all, we all agree it's the Wild West. You know, that's one thing we <laughs> what do. What about agree. on the growing side of things? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, being a, being an advocate for the can the, the medical cannabis use, uh, I find that Prop 64 has had a huge impact on the, on the overall market um, and not necessarily good or bad. Um, I, I tend to lean towards uh, it's more challenging because those folks who have been actively involved in the medical scene uh, are, are finding that there's... You know, there, there's a little pushback with all these different regulations that they're going to be held to. So, uh, of course, some of it's good because we need the standardization, like yeah. Christine pointed out, you know, understanding the testing side of it. That's really an important part. I also feel like um, because it is a new industry or the way in, in a sense, it's a new industry. In, in some sense, it's old because we've been we've had this since the late 90s. Right. And so that development of the medical cannabis industry has been has had time to, to you know, develop through those regulatory uh, you know requirements that help us m make these clear deviations of obviously don't have a bias school but like you know where do we cultivate and so mm -hmm. um, San Diego has been a big proponent of indoor cultivation um, and, and we see that with SB 420 and how they encourage folks to you know take on a few extra plants and a, a limited square footage of cultivation um, but when you're looking at commercial cultivators it, it's still tricky because uh, San Diego hasn't really set any standards for uh, allowing cultivation permits. And I think it's a big issue right now because San Diego is the most productive per acre agriculture in the country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're going to lose that title. Mm -hmm. We're going to watch that slip away if we don't make a quick decision about how to regulate our cannabis cultivation. Absolutely. So, so the dispensaries themselves and, and the members of the supply chain is, are those jobs sustainable? I mean, we, we highlighted like bud tenders are making 15 bucks an hour. Um, we've heard that some security guards are making minimum wage. I, is this an industry that's going to be like fast food where it's like, it's incredibly difficult to be a member of the middle class while you're also mm. a part of this industry, I guess, like. Man, I yeah, sure that's, hope not. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a whole social question because I mean it is retail. You know, if if yeah. we do get down to it, it is it is retail. And you know, I've worked in retail too, making minimum wage. Um, and I wouldn't put it past some of the owners to go mm -hmm. ahead and say, you know what, we're just gonna because you know we have such a turnover. You know, that's another thing is that is there a huge turnover rate, and what exactly are they looking for? Um, right now, since there's really no standardization or any regulations on what bud tenders need to know, um, then it's kind of like, well, I could just hire my friend and, you know, my other friend and my cousin and all that. And if it doesn't work out, I could just fire him. So it's kind of, you know, right now it is looking like a, a minimum wage, mm -hmm. you know, retail job right now, um, un unless we start demanding, you know, a little bit more accountability, you know, coming in and saying, hey, I'd like to know exactly what's in here. Uh, most of the the um, the conversations I have is like, well, the the product rep comes in and kind of tells us about it, I'm like right on. But really, what's in it? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like uh, you guys are kind of. I'm making parallels to the wine world, right? Mm, and there's yep. the sommelier yeah, yeah, who yeah. will get paid a lot more. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And consumers, educated consumers, and as consumers become more educated, mm -hmm. educated about this product apart because mm -hmm. of your efforts and others, um, I think there will be a demand for, you know, I want to go in and ask the this bud tender who may be, you know, 21 years old. I want good answers, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what we're looking for, right? And, and, and that's what we should demand, you know, is to have more of that intricate knowledge of what we are actually ingesting into our bodies, you know, especially when it comes to the concentration level where you're taking loads of product and, you know, condensing it down. You know, I'd like to know specifically what would be in it you know, just before I consume it. So pushing for the snobby consumer. Absolutely. Like. <laughs> the comes the pot snobs. <laughs> well, Christine, will there be another cannabis class coming up? And if so, how can people sign up for it? Yes, or maybe there's yes, an yes, email yes. list? There, there is. Um, it's it's going to be through the San Diego Community College Continuing Education one more time. Um, we're going to be doing this one in June. Um, mm -hmm. So June, I, I don't think we're going to have the Wednesday class for the first week, but it's definitely the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of June. Um, so you can apply online just as if you were to enroll in any uh, community college program so they could find it online. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming in, both of you, Nathan. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. If you are enjoying the podcast, please let us know by emailing my friend Jesse here at jesse at vosd.org. And if you're really enjoying it, consider supporting us by going to voiceofsandiego.org and hitting the donate button. Type in podcast during the checkout.
Thanks for listening to Voices San Diego Podcasts. This show is part of the Voices San Diego Podcast Network. Visit voiceofsandiego.org slash podcast. There you'll learn more about our award-winning arts and education podcast, Culture Cast and Good Schools for All, the Cura Chaos podcast about movers and shakers on both sides of the border, Beer Talk Radio, our business show, I Made It in San Diego, our sports show, The Kept Faith, and the rest of the shows in the network. Voice of San Diego is a nonprofit. The majority of our budget comes from grants and donations from readers and listeners like you. If you like the show, please take a minute to go to VoicesSanDiego.org and click the donate button. Or if you have a business and would like to sponsor the show, contact development at VoicesSanDiego.org or call 619-550-5664.